Tonight, failing to make the grade on student housing. Back to class on Canadian campuses, but hunting for a place to live. A lot of folks are moving into the communities. That's helping to push rents uh, higher. The real life lesson on supply and demand. Soaring wait lists to find nursing home beds. It seems like we are in a version of the movie Groundhog Day. A startling shootout and a man used as a human shield in Ontario. And in BC, the home of a prominent Punjabi music star riddled with bullets. One of Russia's deadliest attacks on Ukraine since the start of the war. Plus, what new underwater images are telling us about the Titanic. It was a little bit of a gut punch. The remarkable view capturing dramatic signs of the ship's decay. CTV National News with Omar Sachedina. Good evening, everyone. More than a million students have returned to colleges and universities across Canada this week. And for many of them, paying tuition is hard enough as it is. And tonight, a clearer picture is emerging of just how challenging it is to find a safe and affordable place to live. A new snapshot reveals on-campus housing is only available to about 10% of students in Canada, well short of what's available to students in the United States, the United Kingdom, or in France. A shortage that's triggering a major warning. CTV's Heather Wright on the impact and the ripple effect on rent prices off campus. Tuition books a place to stay. Student budgets are tight and housing is making it harder for many. Housing is just one of the many things that are like increasing in price. People can't really afford groceries. People can't afford a lot of basics that they need. Only one in 10 students in Canada is able to get a spot in a university or college dorm, according to a new report from Desjardins, which shows Canada is lagging behind other countries when it comes to student accommodation. When you look at other countries, um, there's a lot more partnerships between post-secondary institutions and, uh, and the private sector in providing sort of purpose-built student accommodation. The study says schools in all levels of government need to work together more effectively to cut red tape, ease zoning rules and build more housing specifically for students. And while the federal government has capped the number of international student visas it will approve, the study suggests schools are still struggling to keep pace with demand for housing. More than a million students rent, leading to stiff competition in rental markets that are already tight. We're seeing, especially with a lot of international students, a lot of folks are moving into the communities and uh, rents are, are that's helping to push rents uh, higher, even if it's not the primary culprit. Um, but we're also seeing that, uh, you know, the kind of conditions the students are living in are uh, increasingly uh, detrimental to student outcomes. More students forced to trade proximity to school and even safety to find an affordable place to live. The cheaper it is, the more shady it can be sometimes or it's a, more unsafe. And the study says a lack of safe and affordable housing could deter international students from choosing to study in Canada, which could have the unintended consequence of reducing the pool of skilled workers. At the right CTV News, Toronto. It's not just students struggling to find housing, so are seniors looking for long-term care. And a demographic time bomb is expected to add to the strain. Five years ago, one in six Canadians was over the age of 65. But in a little over a decade, that number will surge to one in four. But as CTV's Sarah Plowman reports, the effects of the unprecedented shift are already in plain sight. More people are waiting for a bed in a nursing home. We've got to fix the issue. We've got Asian population and it's not going to get any better. In New Brunswick, the wait list shot up to more than 1,100 people, according to new numbers shared by a seniors advocacy group. 537 of those waiting are taking up hospital beds. The wait list has jumped by more than 200 since January, with more than 100 new patients waiting in hospital. And it's very frustrating to me and to the families when we see them that they can't move their loved ones out of the hospital setting. It's a national problem. As the population is aging quickly, the demand for long-term care beds is under additional strain. 
Ontario has the longest wait times. Formerly, about 44,000 people are waiting for a bed in long-term care. Informally, that number can be much higher. Advocates are calling for a national strategy, more investments in home care, adult vaccinations, and more long-term care beds. We're losing long-term care home beds faster than we are gaining them. That's exactly the wrong trend for this country. New Brunswick Seniors Advocate released a report back in March calling for urgent action, noting this is not just affecting seniors and their families, but also hospitals and urgent care. But since then, the numbers have moved in the wrong direction. He wants the province to model what's needed and set targets to fix it. It seems like we are in a version of the movie Groundhog Day where Every six months, there's a new flurry of activity. Governor announces tiger teams and programs and protocols, and then the numbers come out, and there's even more people taking up hospital beds. A provincial spokesperson says 165 new nursing home beds have opened up this year, and there's more on the way. One advocate points out how the provincial election is coming up this fall, and they intend to push to make this a major issue. Sarah Plowman, CTV News, Fredericton. We have dramatic new images to show you tonight of a daytime shootout that was captured on a dash cam in Hamilton, Ontario. Two men were seen firing shots at each other on the street. Police say a third man, caught in the crossfire, was used as a human shield. Remarkably, nobody was hurt. No word on what led to the confrontation. Shots were also fired at the home of a popular Punjabi rapper and producer near Victoria. AP Dillon wasn't there at the time, but video has emerged of the incident, which is making international headlines. CTV's Brendan Strain reports. Early hours Monday morning, multiple shots ring out on Ravenwood Road in Colwood. And it was coming from AP's house. AP Dillon, a rising star in the Punjabi music scene. Diane Reed lives nearby and ran to her kitchen window. And while I'm doing that, I see a vehicle leaving, but I couldn't describe the vehicle because there was so much smoke. Smoke from two vehicles set ablaze in the home's driveway. This video taken by the apparent shooter circulated heavily on social media. CTV News has not been able to authenticate this video, although it shows the same house that stands here at 3346 Ravenwood Road today, riddled with 14 bullet holes and showing the obvious aftermath from the vehicle fires in the driveway. I mean, it's surprising to me that the, these type of events are happening in, in this area. Bikram Singh used to live in the area. He came by today to see for himself. It's disappointing to see and shocking as well. The homeowner, A.P. Dillon, was not home at the time of the shooting, although Reed says one man living in the home was. Fortunately, he got out of the house and he was okay. Dillon released this statement on social media saying, I'm safe, my people are safe, Thank you to everyone who reached out. Your support means everything. Peace and love to all. In a statement, RCMP say a preliminary investigation suggests that this was a targeted event and that there is no further risk to the general public. CTV News reached out to the RCMP today for an interview, but was told they will not be taking questions. Why they are not telling us what exactly is happening? We live in the community. We have our right to know that what exactly is happening in our community. Brendan Strain, CTV News, Colwood. An Ontario woman is sharing her unimaginable pain and grief tonight after her 15-year-old nephew was shot and killed yesterday, a day before he was supposed to start grade 11. I want justice for him. I want the police because if there is camera, they have to arrest that person that do that to him because he didn't deserve to die like that. Mario Giddings was shot in this plaza parking lot just across the street from a police station in what's believed to be a targeted attack. Fortunata Giddings was looking after Mario, whose parents live in St. Lucia, and says Mario was afraid to go to school because he had been in a fight. A mother of one of his close friends says there had been trouble with a group in a nearby neighborhood. She took her kids to the Canadian National Exhibition on Monday and regrets not taking Mario with her. I was driving, I wanted to turn back. I wish I did turn back and wake him up and just tell him, come go with us. Come and go and drive and some ride and have some fun. Yesterday, it was the worst time of my life. I enjoy myself with my kids, but at the end, it was just so sad. It was just so, so sad. 
A Quebec Superior Court judge ruled today that racial profiling is a systemic problem in the Montreal Police Service and has ordered the city to pay victims. It's going to uh, basically, hopefully, bring about uh, changes, systemic changes, not only within the police department, but also throughout the city, throughout the municipal administration. A class action lawsuit was seeking up to $5,000 per person who was racially profiled between 2017 and 2019. And while the lead plaintiff will receive that amount, it's unclear what other victims will receive. The process for the payment plan, which the judge needs to sign off on, could take months. To Ukraine now and one of the deadliest strikes by Russia since the war began, killing dozens of people at a military facility and a nearby hospital, raising questions about whether this was a revenge attack for Ukraine's surprise incursion into Russia. CTV's Michael Couture with more on the strike. Ukraine's Military Institute of Communications nearly reduced to rubble after two Russian ballistic missiles struck the area. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky says nearby hospital and apartment buildings were also hit. Zelensky describes how many people found themselves under rubble. While many were saved, more than 50 people were killed. Conceptually, we will hold it. In a new interview with NBC News, Zelensky spoke about his military's incursion into the Kursk region of Russia, which he says was launched to stop the Kremlin from taking more Ukrainian territory. We did have uh, un uh, understanding from our intelligence uh, that Russia uh, was planning to set up a buffer zone. Zelensky says he wanted Ukraine to define that buffer zone before Russia could. In a call with Prime Minister Justin Trudeau today, President Zelensky urged Canada to help convince allies to loosen the limits on Western-supplied weapons so they can be used to hit targets deep in Russian territory, a message echoed by Kyiv's envoy to Canada. We count on Canada's support to talk to, with the allies, to just to, uh, to explain them. Ukraine is also waiting for the delivery of air defense systems promised by countries like Canada. So I don't know how many more tragedies like this have to occur uh, for all promises to be uh, uh, fulfilled. 19 months ago, Canada had pledged to send Ukraine a surface-to-air missile defense system, which has been ordered through the U.S. A spokesperson for Defense Minister Bill Blair told CTV News in a statement, we have been assured by the Americans that it will be delivered in early 2025. That and the use of Western weapons in Russian territory are expected to top the agenda when allies meet later this week in Germany at the Ukraine Defense Contact Group. Omar. All right, Mike, thank you. As the attack unfolded, Mongolia rolled out the red carpet for Vladimir Putin. It was the Russian president's first visit to a member country of the International Criminal Court since it issued a warrant for Putin's arrest last year. But Mongolia, which has close economic ties to Russia, ignored calls to take Putin into custody. The U.S. Justice Department has announced terrorism charges against Hamas leaders in connection with the October 7th attack. Of the six charged, three have already been killed by Israel. The main living figure, Yahya Sinwar, Hamas's top leader in Gaza. Meanwhile, public backlash against Benjamin Netanyahu is mounting as thousands fill the streets of Israel for a third straight day, demanding the country's prime minister make a deal to free the hostages. But he is refusing to change course. A pregnant woman and six children are among the 12 dead after a crowded boat carrying migrants capsized off the French coast in the English Channel. The bottom of the boat ripped open, plunging dozens into the waterway. Rescue boats and helicopters were deployed as part of a huge operation. Officials calling it the deadliest disaster this year for the world's busiest shipping lane. A fresh diplomatic clash is intensifying between Canada and one of its major international markets tonight. China says it will launch an investigation of Canadian canola imports after Ottawa said it would impose new tariffs on Chinese-made electric vehicles, steel and aluminum starting next month. CTV's Rachel Aiello on the fight. Retaliating for Canada's electric vehicle tariff package. 
China is initiating anti-dumping investigations into Canadian canola imports as well as certain chemical products. I think it's fair to say that uh, we're disappointed with the action. Canadian farmers exported $5 billion worth of canola to China last year. They're now refuting Beijing's accusation of price discrimination. We're very confident that uh, through our participation in an appropriate way, uh, we will be able to demonstrate uh, the fair access and competitiveness of Canadian canola. Targeting this major market comes one week after the Canadian government imposed a 100% tariff on Chinese-made EVs and a 25% tariff on imports of Chinese steel and aluminum. Actors like China have chosen to give themselves an unfair advantage. The federal government acted in alignment with its allies, including the United States. But China characterized the tariffs as unilateral, escalating trade tensions. China is trying to camouflage its approach using the rules of the World Trade Organization by saying that, pretending that they are doing an investigation. In fact, it's all uh, preordained. We know uh, already the conclusions will say that Canada is uh, dumping uh, canola. Today, Canada's agriculture minister called the move by China deeply concerning and said the government will defend the sector every step of the way. Canada and China maintain a $100 billion commerce relationship, and experts say next steps will have to be carefully considered. I think we have to try to walk a fine line, and, and one of the added difficulties this time is that some of China has other places it can go for a lot of the products that we sell them. Until the scope of the investigation is made clear, the canola industry says it's too early to understand the full impact of China's trade action. Though, Omar, it could be significant. When Canadian farmers were targeted in 2019, the sector estimated it came at a cost of approximately $2 billion. All right, Rachel, thank you. Coming up. You know that the Titanic is sick and in poor shape now. The race to preserve precious memories on the ocean floor. Plus, Canada races to another gold at the Paralympics. We have some stunning new images tonight from the wreck of the Titanic. 112 years after it sank in the North Atlantic, the ocean is taking a toll, leading to the loss and decay of some of its most recognizable features. CTV's Garrett Barry takes a deeper look. The Titanic is central to Shelley Binder's family story. Her great-grandmother and her first son were some of the women and children rescued during that chaotic sinking. When she got on the Carpathia, she was beside herself. She was, she thought her baby was dead. She had just gone through this unbelievable experience. Binder grew up hearing about the Titanic, what had happened to the ship and her ancestors. And although you know the wreck's collapse is inevitable, it's something altogether different to see it. I have to say it, it was kind of a little bit of a gut punch and, and kind of surprised me as far as my own feeling. The team behind this latest mission released what they called bittersweet results this week. A piece of that iconic bow railing has fallen off the ship, 15 feet of it now lying on the ocean floor, below where it once stood. The first sight that I had of Titanic. Larry Daly photographed that railing when he visited the wreck site in 2003, and he has seen the decay, the bacteria, helping to tear the Titanic apart. It's very sad to see it, and you know that the Titanic is sick and in poor shape now compared to when I dove it 21 years ago. There's a race now to photograph as much of the Titanic wreck as possible before it becomes unrecognizable. But the ship itself is also now a destination for ultra-wealthy adventurers. People whose family did die that day uh, have tend to have a different perspective and, and find it extremely repellent. Binder says some of her fellow descendants of Titanic survivors and victims find it to be in poor taste that a ship that became their family graveyard could become a tourist destination. Gary Perry, CTV News, St. John's. Still ahead. A hockey star sticks with the Edmonton Oilers, taking over the title of the NHL's highest paid player. Pope Francis arrived in Indonesia today for the first leg of a 12-day tour of the Asia-Pacific region, the longest trip of his tenure. 
The 87-year-old pontiff was greeted by dignitaries in Jakarta. Indonesia is the most populous Muslim country in the world. Pope Francis is expected to highlight the importance of interfaith dialogue and will also make stops in Papua New Guinea, Singapore and East Timor. The biggest contract in NHL history was signed by a member of the Edmonton Oilers. Leon Dreisaitl said today it comes with a responsibility to perform on the ice. Is it pressure? In, in certain moments, uh, there is pressure, but, um, you know, I'm going to get paid a lot of money to, to be able to handle those moments. The talented center will be paid $112 million over eight years. That's an average of $14 million a season and will move the 28-year-old from Germany ahead of Toronto's Austin Matthews as hockey's highest paid player when the deal kicks in next year. A group in Alberta is claiming to have played the world's longest baseball game, raising hundreds of thousands of dollars for a good cause. It's been a busy place. We've got a lot of people out of here over the last weekend. And just thank you for people that come and watch. The group played 102 hours of ball from Thursday to Monday near Edmonton and raised more than $280,000 for the Cross Cancer Institute. The final score was 771 to 632. But they are all winners, and so is the Institute. After the break, dreaming beyond the podium at the Paralympic Games. Canada has now struck gold twice at the Paralympics in Paris with two remarkable performances in the pool and on the track, racing to the top of the podium and hoping to inspire the next generation. CTV's Geneviève Beauchemin with the stories. Swimmer Nicolas Bennett's eyes filled with tears of pride when O Canada played in honour of his win. Oh, well, there's not a lot of words, of course, there's a lot of tears and hugs. So. Bennett won gold in the 100-meter breaststroke in a category for swimmers with intellectual impairments. He was diagnosed at age three with autism spectrum disorder. He shared his victory with his sister Haley, his full-time coach. I knew I had the guts to come back a little bit stronger than some of the other athletes, but I didn't expect first. Bennett has also won a silver and has two races to go. His was the first victory of the Paralympic Games in Paris for Canada. Today, the team earned another first place. Cody Forney landed a gold in his first ever Paralympic Games race today, finishing far ahead of the rest of the field. He switched to the sport after years of playing wheelchair rugby. His remarkable performance among the memories that will be part of the legacy of these historic games. Ones that athletes hope will go far beyond boosting interest in Paralympic sports. I think the part of the legacy that is really challenging is the legacy for society, the legacy for accessibility for disabled people and how they can access their very best performance in whichever part of life they exist. At the end of day six of its quest in Paris, Canada has now landed 13 medals. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. Impressive. That's a snapshot of this Tuesday for all of us at CTV National News. Thank you for watching. Good night and see you tomorrow.